just to let you know that today's subject is depyrogenation. Hello, it's great to be back with you today. It's Tim Sandal and I'm um, doing another subject and uh, this is a bit shorter. Uh, it's going to be less than five minutes and it's back to the three points mode. And today's subject, um, as I've just said, is depyrogenation. So let's get some slides up. Okay, so depyrogenation, you're going to be most familiar with, is the idea of the depyrogenation tunnel. But before we say, hey, what is depyrogenation, we need to say, um, what are pyrogens? Well, pyrogens just essentially means anything. It could be a microorganism or it could be a chemical. That when it's introduced into the bloodstream and in the context of pharmaceutical products that generally means products that are injected, that it triggers an immune reaction that causes a fever response. And fever is the temperature inside the body going above 37.8 degrees Celsius. And the word pyrogen it comes from the Greek, so pyros means fire, and the ogen means that it's inside the body. So pyrogens bad, give patient fever. Okay, so why is there the focus on endotoxin and why is endotoxin used as the control for the depyrogenation tunnel? Well, endotoxin is a fragment of the cell wall of a very common morphological group of bacteria, gram-negative bacteria and it's generally the substance that's most resistant to heat. So if we're going to challenge a depyrogenation tunnel, then we want to make sure that we are using something that is the most resistant to heat. And an ordinary autoclave would not be sufficiently hot to kill endotoxin. Autoclave destroys all bacterial cells and spores but the fragments of the cell wall, those that can cause the pyrogenic reaction, can survive that. We've got to get them to hotter temperatures, create super heat. So that's my first point. My second point is, well, what is depyrogenation? Well, <clears throat> depyrogenation is getting rid of pyrogens, including endotoxin. Depending on the method we use, it either means um, removing pyrogen. So let's say we had some rubber stoppers and we were concerned there might be endotoxin on those rubber stoppers. We would use copious amounts of water for injection to keep rinsing those stoppers to remove the endotoxin and flush them away. With a depyrogenation tunnel, what we're trying to do there is inactivate the pyrogen or most likely the endotoxin by blasting it with heat so it no longer functions by changing its um, kind of whole setup, its, its whole protein structure. And for that we use the depyrogenation tunnel. So depyrogenation tunnel has wash files going in, they're gradually heated up, they get to the heating zone where they're blasted with dry heat, which is like um, a thermal wave of heat. Um, at temperature over 300 degrees Celsius, which has been proven, if it's for a sufficient time, which only needs to be between 30 seconds and 3 minutes, uh, enough to inactivate endotoxin. And then we need to cool the bottles down so that they can be used for aseptic processing. So you can see on the slide there, you've got the tunnel set up, and if you follow that away, that's the way the vials are going. But in order to keep contamination control robust, we need to make sure that the air, the pressure cascade, is flowing that away, following the yellow arrows. Okay, so that's point number two. Point number three is, well, why bother? Why does all this matter? Well, we have to wash vials to get rid of particles, but then we end up with wet vials. So wet vials, you know, the water, though it's well controlled, could be a source of endotoxin, and they've got the occasional handling, and then you've got the general environment where you get dust particles in particular, which can also have uh, endotoxin on them. So we need to make sure that we are 
getting rid of the pyrogens. So we are depyrogenating and sterilizing the vials as they go through the tunnel. So we need to take this principle beyond sterilization. And this fits in with our overall aseptic controls. So we want to have vials that, as we're filling them, that we know um, the vials themselves are suitable for a product that is going to be injected into the patient. Okay, so that was five minutes. I'm Tim Sandal. Thanks for.